You're listening to Offshoring and Outsourcing in Philippines. Our regular podcast that looks at the BPO industry in the Philippines and the opportunities for both offshoring and outsourcing as they might apply to customers in Australia, New Zealand, the US, UK, Canada, in fact, anywhere in the world. The Philippines, as you know, has some wonderful resources for offshoring, including a large English-speaking population, an excellent education system, and a wages structure that makes it commercially viable to invest in the Philippines. Shortly you'll be hearing my colleague, Henry Acosta, who will tell you who's been interviewed for this episode. We interview people who run business process outsourcing companies, people who are customers of business processing outsourcing, people who have been customers and now are now not customers, so good, bad or ugly, we like to talk to people and share their experiences in the offshoring and outsourcing industry with you. Each week you'll hear our presenters interviewing Philippines businesses or customers of Philippines businesses. The presenters are myself, Wayne Buckler, Patrick Reyes, and Henry Acosta. For this episode, our first guest is Marla Rausch of Animation Vertigo, and it starts at the 2 minute and 5 second mark of the podcast. For our second guest, we have Frederick Joy of Arcanis Incorporated, and it starts at the 26 minute and 30 second mark of the podcast. For our third guest, we have Adam O'Connor of Cloudstaff Philippines and it starts at the 35 minute and 35 second mark of the podcast. For our fourth and final guest, we have John Manzano of Teledevelopment Services and it starts at the 43 minute and 50 second mark of the podcast. I'm Henry Acosta and welcome to the Outsourcing and Offshore in the Philippines podcast. Today we have Marla Rausch of Animation Vertigo. She founded Animation Vertigo back in 2004. Animation Vertigo is a company that strives to provide unparalleled quality solutions to leaders in film, television, and video games. Since its birth, Animation Vertigo has set the standard in motion capture animation and always exceeded client expectations with great results. Considered as a trailblazer in motion capture outsourcing in the motion capture outsourcing industry, her roster of projects include video games such as Call of Duty, Black Ops 3, Advanced Warfare by Activision, Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls, both by Quantic Dream, Mortal Kombat 10 by Netherrealm, and Hitman by IO Interactive. Thank you for coming on the show, Marla, and it's a great honor having you here. Oh, thank you so much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, um, answer your question. Awesome. <laughs> So for our first question, uh, can you give us a quick introduction about uh, who you are and what you do for Animation Vertigo now? So um, I'm Marla Rausch, uh, De Castro Rausch, actually, uh, Mm -hmm. for uh, my Filipino family. Um, (laughs) I am the founder and CEO of Animation Vertigo. I've been working uh, probably 14 years now for Animation Vertigo, and before that I was a uh, doing some freelance work uh, in motion capture tracking, which is why we kind of got into the whole uh, deciding that we should try to do a company that does motion capture services. Mm, and um, what inspired you to having the idea of building uh, this business, uh, specifically here in the Philippines? Well, uh, a couple of reasons. Um, being uh, Living in California and uh, working in the industry kind of saw the uh, the swing as far as hiring people, training people, and then letting them go because the project was done. This constant influx of uh, hiring and retraining and releasing was kind of problematic for a few companies because, you know, when you spend the time and effort and money to train someone and then you have to re- let them go, sometimes mm-hmm. when you try to get them back, um, you don't have that opportunity because, they've found another job or they, they've decided to move. So uh, we decided that Animation Vertigo would be a great way to be able to fill that particular um, need. Uh, it, I decided that it would be a good idea. What if there was a company that had full-time motion editors that mm-hmm. would be able to, that companies, production companies, would be able to hire when they need them 
And then when they don't need them, they'll still be around and available uh, next time the project comes up. The Philippines came to mind because having been born and raised in the Philippines, I was very familiar with the landscape, with the talent of the Filipino, as well as um, how business generally works there. So it wasn't a big stretch for me to think if I wanted to fill a need, why wouldn't I have the great talent from the Philippines be where I, sh- I set up the business? And that's kind of how I uh, got to where we are today. And uh, what do you think makes the Philippines different compared to uh, maybe other countries that you tried looking at? Um, the biggest uh, advantage that the Philippines has, I think, is the great command of English. Um, especially when I first started, um, a lot of the clients I had was in the United States. So there are certain nuances, there are certain um, terminologies and um, uh, uh, sarcastic wit, for example, that, um, that, that Filipinos get, that they do understand and um, I don't need to explain too much. Um, that said, also the fact that um, I was familiar with the 3D animation talent that the Philippines had. So uh, mm-hmm. putting those both together gave me an opportunity to uh, take advantage of my um, heritage and go back to the Philippines so that I can uh, uh, give opportunities for uh, people who are in the Philippines to work on things that are not available for them and uh, give them an opportunity to uh, be uh, to have their names, for example, in credits and in video games and things like that. So that was kind of nice to be able to do. Yes, yeah, it sounds very cool. And um, <laughs> uh, with regards to any uh, cultural barriers or differences, uh, what do you think is the main cultural difference that you had to tackle when you started out here in the Philippines? I think, um, well, one thing for me definitely was, um, especially in motion capture and animation, Sometimes uh, people make mistakes. There are uh, problems that come up with quality or problems that come up with um, expectations. And generally, uh, here in the U.S., for example, if something like that comes up, it's pretty easy to tell someone, hey, that was wrong, can you redo it? And, you know, and no hard feelings. In the Philippines, something that I did realize was that you had to be careful with how you say things. You had to be a little bit more sensitive to people's feelings. Not that you know, that not that people were way too sensitive or not that um, people in the U.S. were insensitive, but it was just a little bit, you needed to have a little bit more, more care when you give any sort of criticism um, on the work. And I think it's because people in the Philippines really um, take pride in what they do and they want to make sure that what they're doing is correct and they don't want to... Uh, give the impression of either not understanding or um, not being not not comprehending what you were looking for. So that, that's a tough one because um, sometimes you just want to say, "Can you do it again?" It's just wrong, but you need to take the time to explain and make sure that they they did that um, they felt okay with what you were saying and uh, they understood. And that that um, takes a little bit of skill. Um, I think another um, thing that I had to be careful about was um, how um, um, how I approach things. If I tend to speak too fast uh, or tend to try to explain things and think to myself that uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's an easy thing, uh, but then have a lot of uh, metaphors in trying to explain things, sometimes that's a little tough because um, uh, I might not be as clear as I thought I was. So there are those things that I have to kind of um, pay attention to so that I can make sure that my guys understand me and at the same time we're successful. Mm, and um, what do you think makes Animation Vertigo different from other motion capture agencies out here everywhere in the world, actually? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think one of, the, one of the differentiators for us is that I'm actually very... I, I work very closely with the... Uh, leaders and the developers in motion capture. Um, I'm proud to be working closely with people who either are in the development side of the software or the hardware. 
Um, I know uh, a lot of the people who have worked on motion capture for a very long time. And uh, that sort of um, relationship with them allows me the ability to understand um, how the software or the hardware works better. Um, it helps me also um, understand the potential problems and bugs that can come up and gives me the ability to explain this and train my guys and get them uh, to truly understand um, how motion capture works and how to best utilize it, its performance. Um, I think um, having that kind of understanding and having that kind of relationship to the uh, special specialists in motion capture um, is something very different from a lot of other companies. It's easy for companies to set up a motion capture stage thinking, oh, hey, this will be very easy. It's uh, faster than doing any keyframing animation. And look, we just need a stage and we can put it all together. But motion capture is more than that. I've, un I've once had... I've once seen an ad that said something about it's just connecting dots and oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many motion capture um, <laughs> technicians and specialists I knew were just absolutely insulted by that idea. There's a lot of um, complexity to motion capture and um, I really uh, admire the people who are involved in it because um, <laughs> they're just really amazingly smart and innovative people. And um, can you share with us the mission and vision of uh, Animation Vertigo? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, our goal is to be the the one-stop shop when it comes to motion capture animation services. That any company uh, that needs uh, motion capture services, we will be able to not only partner with you to um, solve the uh, the need that you have, but also to make sure that we are like a team. Uh, we we like to consider it like being a plug-in to uh, the company. Everything that they can do in there, it's like having their own team, but it's not actually in-house. And um, can you share with us any experiences of your clients that uh, stand out when yeah. you guys were starting um, out? Well, or Stand out like, uh, recently. It's really cool because um, the people I've met as clients uh, in the past uh, 13 years or so that uh, we've been around, um, I, I like the fact that we not only be, they're not only our clients, but that we become friends. A lot of the clients that I had when I first started back in 2004 remain uh, not only good, uh, not only good partners, but um, good friends as well. Um, I've got a few of them, which was really cool, because one of the things about being a motion capture service provider is that sometimes clients can try other people out or other companies out, and you understand that. They want to be able to make sure that they're not only being fair to their bottom line, but also see what else is out there. Um, I had a one particular uh, client who had gone out and... Uh, tried another group, mm -hmm. and probably halfway through their production had contacted me and basically said, all right, Bala, we're on fire. There's a lot of things um, we need. It's not getting done the way we need it. Can we just send it back to you? And uh, and then, you know, we're really sorry. And Which is really kind of funny if you think about it because, you know, mm -hmm. if you just have a, a client-vendor relationship, you don't really hear the words, I'm sorry, you know, for trying somebody else, but can you get it back? So I kind of like that, that it's a, it's a more personal relationship that we have with um, with our clients and partners. And mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that even though they try, other people, they still come back to us just because they're sure that we will be able to um, make things work for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, how do you guys get your clients? Well, there's various ways. I think one of the best things that uh, I'm proud of is the fact that a lot of my clients I got through word of mouth, not even through direct marketing or going out and meeting them in conventions. A lot of the clients that I've, uh, I've uh, uh, had and have um, came because somebody else referred me to them. Um, the quality and the workmanship that we were doing for um, a client of ours, um, they'd talk to another person and say, you need to work with Animation Vertigo. 
they really helped us out. They really, you know, they they, they solved this, you know, problem we've been having. It, it, it's been great. So that sort of thing is, is pretty cool because you um, you realize that you matter to the to your clients and they are they think of you high enough to refer you. On the other hand, it also means that I need to make sure that I don't embarrass them for referring me. So I need to make sure that my quality level and the expectation that I provide for uh, the people they refer me to and the companies they refer me to um, uh, are up to par. Um, other times we've uh, had clients because um, one company, for example, uh, we were we worked with Midway before, and uh, mm-hmm. Midway unfortunately had shut down, and so. Uh, Various people had left the company and gone to simply other places. Um, in that instance, uh, when they went to other motion capture production companies, they contacted me from there and said, Hey, Mala, I'm here now. I want to introduce you to our, you know, motion capture production guy and, uh, we'd like to continue working with you. So that's pretty cool because, um, that meant that, uh, what work we did was actually quality work and something they appreciated. And um, with uh, anyone who's interested with becoming an employee for Animation Vertigo, yeah. uh, how do they become an employee, and what do you look for uh, for an inside an employee? Well, there's a, a few things. If it's going to be in the Philippines, um, everybody can actually go to my website at uh, www.animationvertigo.com, and there's a jobs um, tab there where you can. Sign in and fill out. I always ask for a cover letter and a resume because we want to know more about you, not just what you do. Just send that to us, and it can either go to the U.S. company or to the Philippine uh, studio. What do I look for when I hire employees? I'm looking for people who have an animation eye, who are what I call technical artists. That they're artists, but they're also pretty... So, uh, savvy with the technical part, programming, knowing Python is a big thing. Having an animation, an animator's eye is very important. And by that, I mean, if you can look at a character walking and you can see when something pops or you can see when something's looking unnatural, that's going to be a good sign for me that you know what you're looking at. You'd be surprised, Henry, the number of times where you're looking at something and uh, when you apply as a, in a position in our company, we do require training and testing because there's not uh, a lot of motion capture. There's actually no other motion capture uh, service provider in the Philippines. So we do provide the training. And um, the number of times when a test would be given and, you know, uh, as you apply, how many times people actually fail to see a pop or an unnatural, an unnatural gait or a neck issue in an animation. And those are the things that we look for because that's the sort of quality level that we expect from our very, very basic um, employee. So if anyone out there is looking to be um, a technical artist and wanting to uh, do more in the motion capture side of animation, feel free to visit my website. Awesome. And um, can you say that the businesses of your clients have grown since they started working with you guys? They definitely have had more um, more work that they can pass through through their their stages. Um, it used to be that they were kind of limited by the amount of motions and shots and shoot days that they can do because they had to imagine how much time it would take for a company to turn that around and make sure that it goes into their motion capture animation pipeline. Uh, nowadays, that part of, you know, oh, Let's only do a few days, shoot days, or let's, you know, have a, a best of, uh, you know, a best shot list. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's not that way anymore. They can actually really literally do, excuse me, hundreds of motions. Decide, yeah, let's just go, you know, do this. It's pretty simple. Marla and her team can uh, get it done pretty quickly and then we'll just select it afterwards. And I think in that sense, they grew because they're they're no longer limited by either time or how much work can come back to them to be able to be uh, animated. So that's a that's a good thing because then um, the product actually comes out better because they're able to choose animations and scenes that are the best. What are the common misconceptions that you usually face when you guys get clients? Ah, 
How about uh, misconceptions? Um, I think one of the biggest ones is um, the uh, the potential for IP to not be protected. The Philippines isn't known for their high IP protection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, you know, sometimes you worry about um, piracy, you worry about, well, just making sure that their um, IP is protected. It's certainly something that requires further government um, intervention, making sure that we, that the government and the law are able to provide um, reassurance to foreign companies that if they do bring in any technology or any type of uh, IP into the country, that any breach of that will be protected and will be uh will be or not protected but will be um, will be taken care of we you know a lot of the clients are very concerned that their um that their intellectual property might not be protected in the Philippines. so um that's something that you i kind of have to um reassure constantly mm -hmm. um because we're not we are. We can protect ourselves, and we can do things that will be that we would allow us to protect our clients' IP. Another common misconception, which I'm still trying to um, work at, is um, the fact that we actually work in beaches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like to tell I like to tell my clients who are welcome to come to the Philippines and visit us, you know, see the company and things like that, and uh, then go to the beach, which is you know three or four hours away. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, we don't actually work at the, by the shores or, or on beaches, and that would be nice. Though I think I'd really like that. I think my team would like that if we work by the beach. But I don't know if our production would actually be so efficient. <laughs> and um, since uh, you lived here in the Philippines, can you share with us any memorable experiences that you've had here? I think uh, something that happened just recently. I think it was one of the biggest typhoons in Metro Manila that had hit and. Uh, it has it, Metro Manila doesn't get hit by big typhoons and that that much. And uh, that particular time, there was a lot of flooding. Um, our team was um, a lot of members of our team was actually affected, and um, it was pretty amazing to me. And I think it it made a mark for a lot of my um, clients and friends here in the, in the U.S. because I was telling them how. Some of my guys were at the office during the height of the storm, and they decided not to go home because they weren't sure if the other people, other team members, would be able to come into work. And so, and there were deadlines coming up, and so they decided, you know, they'll stay put, they'll continue working, they'll work from the office. Um, other members of the team uh, work to get back to the office so that they can go to the studio knowing that we had a huge deadline coming up and, you know, work, waited through um, the flood waters and got to the office. And it was really something quite different. Um, my husband had said something about it's pretty amazing the work ethic that the Filipino people have when it comes to making sure that they are able to do what they're responsible for doing. They care for the company in a way that's quite different from um, from how people here in the U.S., for example, might care for the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the other side of that, um, when we had team members who had lost homes, property, um, we all gathered together and we made sure that uh, the company itself was able to provide groceries, um, uh, items that they could uh, use so that they could um, get back on their feet, things like that. I tapped um, clients then to be able, if they were willing to send um, uh, items to the Philippines to help not only my team, but also those who had lost things. And I tell you, there were probably nine or ten boxes that we were able to send to the Philippines at that time with our, our uh, marketing stuff and um, T-shirts and blankets and things like that from our various cl uh, clients, and I thought that was pretty amazing. Uh, it was memorable for me because it reminded me of what um, the people can do when things get tough, 
they kind of bond together and they are family together. And I'm pretty proud of that. Hmm. Well, that, that sounds very remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> and <Yeah>. um, <laughs> for our last question, uh, right. how can anyone who's interested in working with Animation Vertigo get in touch with you? Um, our website, uh, animationvertigo.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Animation Vertigo. Um, and uh, again, there's uh, that job um, tab that you can use on our website. Or send us a message, and we'll be replying back to you. Awesome. Well, thanks for being in the show, Marla. And we really appreciate you taking the time doing this interview. Not a problem. Thank you so much, Henry, for having me. And uh, that was really fun. Thank you. Awesome. Again, that was Marla Rausch, founder of Animation Vertigo. She founded Animation Vertigo back in 2004 and has since helped push forward and lead the motion capture industry. She is not only very successful with Animation Vertigo, but she is also a great philanthropist. She's a great example for everyone around the world who strives to build a successful career on what they want to do for the rest of their lives. So thanks for being on the show, Marla, and it's an honor having you here. And to all the listeners out there, thank you for sticking with us. If you have missed the interview or want to listen to it again, it's available on offshoring.com.ph. You can also find us on SoundCloud and iTunes, so please hit the subscribe button there. Hi, it's the Outsourcing and Offshoring in the Philippines podcast, and it's your host for today, Henry Acosta. Today we have Frederick Joy. Fred has many years of experience in growing international businesses. Fred has been leading the sales, marketing, and business development arms of Arcanis from day one. Arcanis is one of the most respected software development companies, not only in the Philippines, but also by the startups it supports in Europe, the US, and Australia. Fred has a passion for innovation and entrepreneurship, enabling to solve global issues at an unprecedented scale through technology. Working with and being part of startups that one day will change the way people live and do business. He is the reason behind creation of Arcanus Labs, the investment arm of Arcanus Group. Welcome to the show, Fred, and it's a pleasure having you here. Hi, Henry. Thanks for having me. For our first question, can you give us a quick introduction about who you are and what you do for Arcanus? Yeah, sure. So I'm Frederick Joy, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Arcanus, and um, I'm in charge of sales and marketing for the company. So what gave you the inspiration of having the idea of building an outsourcing business, specifically here in the Philippines? Uh, so I moved with my business partner in 2010 to Cebu. Um, we, we purchased a company that was active in online games, and uh, from there, uh, we noticed that the skills of not only the customer agents that we needed for this e-commerce business, but also programmers, uh, was uh, the skills were very good in Cebu. So then we first decided to hire a few developers on our own for our needs. And then uh, a lot of our entrepreneur friends from, from abroad, Europe and the US, started asking us to help them out with software development. So this is when we created our Canis and, and started focusing exclusively on this. Uh, what do you think makes the Philippines different compared to other countries that service offshore outsourcing? And what are the main benefits of outsourcing here? So I would say mostly the people. Uh, the skills are good. The English uh, level of the, the Filipinos is, is the best you can find in Asia. And also they're very friendly and easy to work with. So that was, uh, I think that's one of the key points. Uh, I would say yeah, I don't think there is anywhere on this planet where people are nicer to work with. And also, of course, the, the wages are, are lower than, than in, other, uh, in many other countries. Were there any cultural barriers that you faced during your transition period here in the Philippines? Some, but much less than when I moved to Hong Kong, surprisingly. Uh, there, there were a few adjustments we needed to make, um, notably their, their relationship with time. But other than that, I think we we were pretty close culturally speaking. So uh, and the, the of course the the language uh, barrier didn't, didn't really exist since their English is so good. How has been the experience of your clients, and can you give us any testimonials from them? Yeah, I mean mostly it's been great for our clients, um, and I I got a testimonial. Uh, yesterday for, from a client that the last one I got and I can read it to you 
uh, so, so they, they wrote, together with our Canis, we developed an innovative mobile and edutainment platform for Android and iOS. The management and team of our Canis is extremely professional, responsive and flexible to all our project's needs. Uh, they are indeed one of the best development teams we have worked with in Southeast Asia. Uh, so this was written by Mike uh, Frelman, the co-founder of Quizbiz. What makes Arcanis different from other outsourcing agencies here in the Philippines? I think it's because we have such a long track record of building companies, uh, one of which was totaling close to $100 million in sales per year, uh, with more than 350 people working uh, for us. And I think we also understand the needs of, of the companies uh, that want to innovate through uh, software tools. I mean, that's what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years. And I think we can really help them with this difficult, but I think at the end, very rewarding process. What is the main vision and mission of your company? Yeah, so our mission is to help businesses to do more with uh, less money and, and help them generate uh, revenue quicker. That's really our core mission. And I would say for, for uh, the vision, um, it's to keep on helping those companies, but also for startups, we have recently launched a venture capital back program where we invest technology and money for, uh, for equity in these startups. How is your process for recruiting clients or how do you get clients to get interested in Arcanis? Um, I would say it's most, mostly through our network and, and referral from other clients. Uh, but we also create content, reach out to companies that we know have certain needs. And this is also an interesting flow of clients for us. So for any interested employees out there, uh, what are the processes that they have to go through? And what do you look for in hiring employees? So mostly we hire uh, people through our staff, uh, staff's referrals. That's the best working. We also advertise, of course, but uh, mostly through our staff. And so once we decide to interview a candidate, uh, when we've looked at his resume, the, the candidate goes through a series of personal interviews and technical tests so we can assess their skills. And um, when most of the time after being hired, our staff goes through, a, I would say, a training program where we teach them how to work with our clients following our specific uh, methodology. What we're looking also for is that we're looking at experienced developers that are also fast learners. Uh, so we, we're looking at their abilities to grow over time because the projects they work on are usually pretty challenging. Can you say that the businesses of your clients have grown considerably since they started working with Arcanis? Yes, um, most of our clients have, and uh, which is, what is nice is that we grow with them. So uh, the reason is that they can simply do so much more with the same financial resources since we're two to three times cheaper than uh, what they could get in, in their own countries uh, and at the same level of quality. What are the common misconceptions that you usually face about outsourcing here in the Philippines? I think most of the time um, it revolves around the cultural issues. They're afraid of, 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 of that, but there are much more, uh, much less uh, cultural problems than with other Asian countries. I've been working in India and in China and, and the Philippines is not that complicated. And um, also, I think some prospects are asking us about the internet and other infrastructure questions. And uh, although this used to be a problem uh, years ago, I must say this has gotten so much better in, in recent years as it, and is not a problem anymore. Do you have any memorable experiences that you can share with us uh, ever since you started staying here in the Philippines? Every day is a memorable experience because uh, when we're interacting with Filipinos, it's just great. They're always nice and, and, and friendly. And other than that, um, I mean, the Philippines has so much to, to offer in terms of nature. So like, I don't know, swimming with the whale sharks or, or uh, diving is always pretty incredible. And for our last question, uh, how can anyone who's interested in Arcanis get in touch with you? Either potential clients or even employees? Yeah, so for clients, they can get in touch via our website, uh, arcanis.com or by email directly to me, so at fred at arcanis.com, also through LinkedIn. And for employees, the best is to go through the careers page where we always have our uh, open jobs that they're listed there and um, they can apply for specific jobs. We're currently looking to hire about 20, 20 people. 
Thanks for being on the show, Fred. It's been great having you here. You're welcome, Henry. Thanks for having me. Again, that was Frederick Joy, one of the founders of Arcanus, helping push and innovate our world with technology while solving one global issue at a time. Arcanus is one of the most respected software development companies, not only in the Philippines, but also in Europe, USA, and Australia. It's Henry Acosta, and you've been listening to the Outsourcing and Offshoring in the Philippines podcast. Thank you for listening to us. If you've missed this interview or want to listen to it again, an audio file is available on SoundCloud and iTunes. Transcripts and archive are available at offshoring.com.ph. You're listening to our regular podcast, Offshoring and Outsourcing. And now, one of our sponsors is joining us to have a chat. It's Adam O'Connor. Adam's a sales director with CloudStaff, a uh, business process outsourcer based predominantly in Clark in the Philippines, but also with offices in Manila. Adam, welcome to Offshoring and Outsourcing. Thanks, Wayne. Good morning. How are you? Um, I'm very well, and thank you for uh, joining us as a sponsor. Adam, can you fill us in on what it is that uh, CloudStaff offers to the market? CloudStaff offers a, a wide range of different uh, skill sets to the market. Uh, we provide a low-cost offshore solution for uh, Western businesses to be able to utilize the skills that we have here and make sure that they're getting the right people at the right cost for their businesses. Now, Adam, where would you position cloud staff in the spectrum of, of business process outsources? I mean, some have uh, as few as 10 or 20 staff and some have thousands of staff. Where do you fit into the spectrum? Currently, we're just over a thousand staff. Um, we, in in terms of the skill sets that we do, we focus on a wide range of skills, which allows companies to have a team of differentiating skills and competencies within one location. We don't focus on just one area, such as accounting or um, tele services. We we bring teams together that work for for the same company. Adam, some of the uh, some of the, the businesses that we talk to make a, a a big distinction between offshoring and outsourcing. Where do you see cloud staff sitting? I think we we are an offshoring company. Um, I think you can outsource within the same country as as you're in. A lot of companies, if we use Australia as an example, um, will outsource their IT functions to a company within Australia. The offshoring element means we, we do have an Australian entity, but we primarily focus all of our talent that we give to companies from the Philippines at this moment in time. And who's your typical customer? Or if that's not a fair question, can you give us a, a, a portrait of some of your customers? Our typical customers are from the SMEs, small to medium enterprise category, anywhere from uh, sort of five people in their office all the way up to 2,000, 3,000 people within their Western office with their teams over here. So Adam, um, SMEs who are only looking for a few staff shouldn't be put off contacting you then? No, absolutely not. We're happy to help everybody and, and we look to help everybody that we can. And what about the larger players who are looking for a particular service, if, if it be um, uh, you know, someone looking to do uh, accounts receivable for them or someone looking to, to chase outstanding debts? Do you do that kind of um, one service um, arrangement that some of the bigger BPOs do? Yes, we do. We do um, large teams within one vertical for, for companies, but we find that once somebody's got some, something working quite well, that they'll look to expand. But we definitely focus on one vertical if, if a customer wants to. Now, Adam, I notice on your website that the, the catch cry or the, the, um, the slogan, if you will, on, and I'll mention the website, www.cloudstuff.com, the catch cry is uh, people and technology at the heart of everything we do. Can you unpick that for us and explain how people are at the heart and how technology is at the heart of cloud staff? The people that are at the heart of everything that we do because we feel that we um, can supply the talent of a similar standard to the West in, in the roles that our customers are looking for at a fraction of the cost. To make this easy for our customers, we, we provide a technology suite that we've developed ourselves, which faces both the employees in within cloud staff and the employees within Australia, and also the customers manage a view to have a look across everything. We have web um, applications, we have mobile applications, 
and we have systems to help make the transition really easy as well. Pretty much everyone I talk to says the two things or three things that kind of everyone in the Philippines in the outsourcing industry talks to me about is that they have excellent infrastructure and they have uh, excellent technology and they have excellent pools of recruits. You develop a lot of your technology in-house. Is it unique? A lot of it is unique, Wayne. Um, we bring together systems that we have developed ourselves into a suite which is easy, accessible and gives you a, an unfair advantage, I guess, if, if I can be bold to say that, that allows you to train staff, um, keep communication with staff all from one portal. Uh, this allows us to keep up to date with what the customer is looking for, what the account managers on the ground in the Philippines are looking at and, and keeps everybody informed on a real-time basis. I see. I understand uh, that you're an Australian firm. Is that the extent of your corporate structure? Uh, no, we have entities in the UK, Australia and Hong Kong, as well as in the Philippines here. And is there an advantage to the customer in you having that, that multiple entity arrangement? The customers are able to bill out of either Hong Kong or Australia. Some, some of our customers, not all of our customer base is based out of Australia, depending on where customers are based, they can choose which entity to bill out of and which entity to actually hold a contract with. What about management? Is your management Australian based? No, our management is all on the ground in the Philippines and we combine Filipino management and, and Western management as well. Now, that's an, another thing that I hear a lot from BPAs is that they have uh, Filipino managers. Are they senior managers within CloudStar? We do have some senior management. The senior management um, team of cloud staff is split between Western and Filipino. I see. Adam, uh, we're running out of time, but if you had a message for prospective customers um, about why cloud staff uh, is, the, is the place they should be looking for for their offshoring, what would the message be? Um, I guess cloud staff has four key differentiators from ourselves and, and competition. Um, one of them is how we recruit. Everybody has the same set of talent that they recruit from, but we have recruitment locations situated in Makati, here in Clark, and also down in Cebu, which gives us uh, the breadth of the Philippines. Um, we use the training simulators that places candidates in real-world situations, so when they come to our customers, they're fully prepared. We're able to write those training systems for, with the help of our customers specifically for them. Um, our systems that we've already covered previously make the ongoing relationship between the staff here in the Philippines and the staff in the West, wherever you may be, seamless and easy. Uh, our ecosystem of tools with mobile apps for the staff here allows them to be able to carry on working no matter what's going on. And, and our culture, we have a aim to be the number one workplace in the Philippines. We put in a lot of strategy around retention and keeping our staff happy. We have a number of different social events outside of work, um, such as monthly barbecues, but we also have clubs that the staff join with outside interest to make sure that we are one big family. Um, and I would encourage anybody who's interested to actually come over here and have a look at the operation of the cells, which I'd be happy to show them, and, and they can see it for themselves. Adam, speaking of people getting uh, coming over to see you, how do people get in touch with you? Um, if they can either via the website, which is www.cloudstaff.com, or alternatively, they can email me directly at adam at cloudstaff.com. And that's Cloudstaff, C-L-O-U-D-S-T-A-F-F, all one word. Correct. Adam, it's been a pleasure having you on Offshoring and Outsourcing, and, uh, and we do thank you for your sponsorship of the podcast. Thanks, Wayne. I appreciate the time. Hi, I'm Henry Acosta and welcome to the Outsourcing and Offshoring in the Philippines podcast. Today we have John Manzano, the Country Manager of Teledevelopment Services. He provides consulting services and solutions to the world's biggest companies and has been helping them achieve their goals for the past 25 years. He has over 20 years of experience in startup operations, corporate management, service delivery, digital transformation, and account acquisition. He previously served leadership roles in both captive and outsourced companies such as QBE, Cognizant, 24-7 Incorporated, TRG, Convergis, BGL, and HSBC. Today we're here to talk about outsourcing and offshoring here in the Philippines and about what teledevelopment services can bring to you. Hi John, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure having you here with us. Hi Andy, thanks as well. Uh, thanks for having me. 
Can you give us a quick introduction about who you are and what you do for Teledevelopment Services? Yeah, so I'm, I'm John Manzano. I'm the, currently the country manager for Teledevelopment Services. We, we do have a sister company as well, which is the BPO Career Hub. So we're repackaging that in a, in a couple of months. So we're, we're going to just call it Work, which is basically a job portal that is actually catering now, currently just catering to the BPO industry as well. So I, I, I manage both uh, day-to-day operations, client acquisitions, uh, as well as managing, again, uh, making sure that we, we deliver on our client expectations. And what do you think makes the Philippines different compared to other countries that service offshore and outsourcing services? I, I think the, the key attraction for a lot of locators here in the, in the country is one is our, is our ability to speak in English. Of course, uh, I think uh, I believe we're in the top three in, in terms of English capabilities uh, speaking. Uh, that's one. The second component, I believe, we're actually much more catered to customer service. The Philippines, being very Westernized culture, uh, we 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 have the passion to 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 have the service uh, and, and support a lot of verticals. May it be in the telco industry, may it be in the financial industry. Slowly now, we're seeing a lot of migration as well from an insurance standpoint, retail, and, and of course, a lot of uh, other industries that's also uh, looking to consider here in the Philippines. A lot of it, uh, pro- mostly in the social media aspect, Uber, Facebook, Grab are, are also set, starting to set up here in the Philippines. Well, what makes teledevelopment services different from other outsourcing agencies that are already established here in the Philippines? I, I think our, our key differentiator is, uh, you know, we, with us having more than, you know, 12 years of experience in the market, we, 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 we have really set up and assisted a lot of startup companies, you know, particularly from their market entry options. Just this year alone, for example, we've assisted, we're working on our sixth startup company, and these are companies that really have have heard that the Philippines is a great location to outsource and do business with and, live, and leverage on labor arbitrage. You know, our advantage is the, uh, our ability to assist these companies with their options. There are varying requirements for, for some businesses. For some businesses, they would just want to outsource maybe one or two FTEs. You know, we provide them a, a, a very good consultation and overview of what are their options to consider here. At, 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 the, at the other end of that market is once they're into their, we have guided them on their market entry options, we then provide them as well with a list of what are their enablers for them to make it successful here. Typically, we do have partnerships with most of the brokers and, and landlords here in the uh, Philippine space. So if they want to find a space to set up their office, we, we have uh, partnerships existing with that. We also assist them with their connectivity and you know telco and IT infrastructure. So we do have key partnerships in that area as well. And at the back end of that, of course, is the people component where we come in. So we we help a lot of these companies really help uh, recruit their first few key hires. That could be in the form of a country manager or a director for operations. And then of course the the other component that we help them hire would be their HR people, the HR directors, the HR uh, VPs to help them start the company. After which, of course, we, we do have a lot of resources looking in from a training standpoint. So if you if they need trainers as well to assist with their ramp, we also have that ability to support their growth. So I, I think from an industry standpoint, our, our advantage really is we know the market. Mm-hmm. We can help them find a location, build their site, assist them with those things, and also help the people component. It is very critical, especially in a lot of, with, with the market being competitive right now. Yeah, I think that's, that's the value that we put in, in in a lot of these engagements. And what will be your advice for anyone who's planning to outsource here in the Philippines? We, we always get that. I think the, the first and foremost uh, advice is they, they need to have a client already. You know, I think I, I have seen a lot of, you know, businessmen that would just say, okay, the Philippines is a good location to uh, to put up a, a business. You know, they would invest millions. But uh, you know, a key driver for that is they need to have a client that can do the business. So so that's, that's my first advice. I think that the second advice, of course, is they really need to look at what type of service they need to to consider outsourcing. So that, that's a very important one because, 
the back end of that is you need to hire the right people for those specific jobs that they need to outsource. Maybe in the field of finance, maybe in the field of HR, or maybe in the you know the the normal call center work of uh, basic customer service. So those are I think you know my my top two advices. For some cases as well, it would also be very dependent also on the client. So th- there are some clients that, for example, would be would have already presence and they would want to maybe leverage on a particular location, really from a business continuity standpoint. So. You know, a lot of them would have vendors in Manila, so we we do advise them to to make sure that you know, they they probably would need to locate in, a, in another city, uh, maybe a Cebu or uh, another uh, top tier city for as a as a contingency standpoint. Uh, so so those are my my usual uh, advice and consultation. Again, it really depends as well on the number of FTs that they need that they need to outsource because if if you're gonna do less than 300. 250 FTEs. There are several options that you could really consider in, in doing business here, which is not very capital intensive. So basically, it really depends on the engagement of the client, Henry. Mm. And I see that we were talking about clients already. Can you share with us any experiences from your clients and any testimonials from them? Yeah, I think you know, we, in, our, in our existing engagement, we, we have a, a client that was that was into starting up their first operations here. You know, they were they are actually a captive, so they they also needed to to understand the market. So one of our key engagements there was to help you know find a partner for them to to set up their operations here. So we did that. Second stage of that is we actually hired their first key leaders from country manager up until their HR training and and then operations and. You know, they've been very successful. They now have grown to easily 100 FTEs. They uh, have now plans to even grow because of their success. They have now plans to to now even not only do their support functions from their insurance, but they're also looking to consider by next year uh, their growth plans for a help desk to support their uh, Australian IT requirements. Uh, that, that's another one example. Again, it varies from one customer. There is a mm-hmm. uh, one client that we've actually assisted as well, wherein they were a new player. They didn't have a brand out there in the market, so you know branding here is very important. So we actually use our digital marketing recruitment approaches for them to hire their first few ramp. So they they had a. Cl- they already had a client coming over here, so we, you know, there was a requirement for them to ramp up to 40 FTEs. Just by doing a lot of our digital marketing, we were able to fulfill that uh, requirement in in a span of less than one month, as compared to an industry average of usually around 45 to 60 days. And then they've been very uh, successful. They have grown now already from last year to around 60 FTs. They're now growing to close to 300 road plants by next year. So those are you know, some, some key examples of uh, how we have assisted a lot of these uh, startup companies here. With regards to any interested employees, uh, what is your process with when you're recruiting for employees and what exactly do you look for or what are the values that you're looking for within employees? Well, for a lot of the, for a lot of, I, I think it's very common uh, across all businesses. When, when you're recruiting for the right people, I think the first process is, process there is really uh, creating that profile for you to to look at. So, for example, you know, may, it may be from a a call center that would want to do, say, a help desk. The, you know, if we we sit down with the client and say, what are the specific requirements for, you know, help desk could vary from just being doing tech support for a wireless modem, or it could go as far as a SaaS platform wherein they're really looking at the connectivity of that platform with the existing systems that that company is using. So it really varies. So we really sit down with the profile first with the client, do calibration sessions. At the back end of that, Henry, you know, from a recruitment process, I think what we've done very differently here in the market since it's very competitive here is we we approach it the way we look at applicants as like consumers. We look at the attraction standpoint first. So we 
we make sure that you know we did uh, some analysis that 80% of people prior to joining a company they would need to do a research first on what company they're they're joining. So we we do a lot of brand uh, and to say what are your key differentiators for you to attract that pe uh, that person. Uh, so that's the attraction component. So we do that recruitment marketing component. So for for them to be considered, we ask them to be you know we put some engagement, uh, gamification as part of their assessment. As you know, the millennials are uh, are, are the new uh, people that we want to attract. So, you know, we're keeping them engaged. I think at, at, at the back end of that, as you, you know, the industry here in Hemp is still very competitive. You know, so once you, you've got them into the door, you need to assess them. You know, with the industry average is around 10, 10 to 12 percent. So if uh, 100 applicants come in l looking to screen for voice, that 100 applicants will probably, the industry will probably hire around 10 to 12 people only, basically based on English speaking fluency. So we do have as well, you know, under teledevelopment, we are a distributor for an assessment tool called Versat, which mm -hmm. is actually an AI type of assessment tool. So it assesses your a person's capability to speak and write in an English manner. So, so that's how we recruit it. And of course, the final interview, we partner with the client and make sure that they're very calibrated and more of a job fit. So that's how we, we recruit here in the market. And what's the biggest challenge that your clients usually face when they're transferring or starting outsourcing here in the Philippines? I think the, the first one, of course, is always you know, where to locate and, and they need to understand where the market is. I think one of the biggest challenges sometimes is a lot of the companies, specifically for the last players to consider outsourcing, they would probably be in the, as, as the least considered a company. So branding is a, a big component of that. So that's the biggest challenge that they would probably look at, how to attract the right people not only from an entry level position but also from key leaders. So the the second challenge that they face as well, of course, is when you're starting your biggest challenge is how do you get that support function. So we, we come in there as well as, as con consultants and guiding them to what are the tools to use, what are the you know when they're building their cost model to, for them to become very efficient and profitable in this industry. We, we give them a very good detailed market study on the comp and benefit salary structures of, of the industry. That's very critical when they're building their own cost model. So that's the biggest challenge that they have. So, for example, in our current engagements for some of our clients, we, we spend more than at least two to three days building that cost model for them to make sure that they do it right because you know, they, they, they would lose money if they don't build their cost models very well. So that's the free market entry. You know, the, the, the challenge as they go when they're operating, of course, with, with how to be, uh, to make their in employees engage and retain them. Uh, attrition is still going to be a key factor and a key challenge for a lot of this industry. So, you know, making sure that they're very competitive from a competent standpoint, that's one. What are the types of engagement activities that these companies would do? And now what we're seeing in the market is they're creating a lot of these Google-type environments mm -hmm. that are, or the collab space rather than the usual workstations and cubicles. So, uh, you know, those are the types of engagements that we, we also sit down with the client. For a last question, how can anyone who's interested in teledevelopment services get in touch with you guys? Also, uh, where is your physical location? Yeah, well, uh, well that you can easily get in touch with us through our website www.teledevelopment.com. They could see the whole range of products and services. They could also reach to us through LinkedIn as well. And then uh, our offices is where we're located in Ortigas area. So we are on the 35th floor of Robinson's Equitable Power uh, across ADV Avenue, Pasig City. Or they could reach as well if they would want to get some businesses. They could reach us at marketing at teledevelopment.com as well. Well, John, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you as well. And that was John Manzano, the country manager of Teledevelopment Services. I'm Henry Acosta, and this is the Outsourcing and Offshoring in the Philippines podcast. If you want to listen and find out more about outsourcing and offshoring here in the Philippines, you can go on our website, www.offshoring.com.ph. You can also find us on SoundCloud and iTunes.
you have been listening to an episode of Offshoring and Outsourcing Philippines, a regular production of Vertical Internet Media Limited Hong Kong, which produces internet media content for internet radio and podcasting. And you may have also heard this week Henry Acosta and Patrick Reyes. The opinions expressed on this program are strictly those of the speaker. They are not the opinions of either Vertical Internet Media, its management, or the presenters of the show. To get in touch with Vertical Internet Media Limited, head off to our website at www.offshoring.com.ph or you can call our Australian number 0731 and the voice prompts will direct you through to offshoring and outsourcing. It's been my pleasure to have you with us today. I wish you a very good day.